When you think of likely terrorist targets in the United States, you think of places where it's happened before, New York, Washington, or other big cities like Chicago or Los Angeles. But a small town in Ohio? That's where, long before 9-11, authorities found a huge cache of explosives and weapons. The accidental discovery in a self-storage facility left federal agents scratching their heads. Whose weapons were they, and how exactly were they going to be used? It's a mystery that took years of tireless investigation to solve. Here's John Hockenberry. Bedford, Ohio is on the road to nowhere. A little town where the freight train stops only once a day. Few would call this place a destination. Not so long ago, you would have gotten laughs if you had suggested this bedroom community had any connection to a global terrorist network. All the people who live in Bedford, Ohio, could have fit into the World Trade Center with room to spare. But long before the attack on the Twin Towers, investigators believe this town had its own very real brush with terrorism. It also happened on a September morning, back in 1996. September 13th, it was Friday the 13th, and uh, I was waiting for the black cat to jump out from around the corner. You're superstitious? Not very, but uh, a little. Pete Elliott is a special agent for the Federal Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, the ATF. Based in nearby Cleveland, he works mostly violent crime cases involving firearms and explosives. But he was about to embark on a case like none he had ever seen. What began as a routine case would take four years to solve. In the end, it would bring renewed attention to a shadowy world where terrorists out for revenge used bombs and assassinations for a cause they believed was just. And it would lead to suspicions that a prominent member of a northern Ohio community, a man with influence and friendships at the highest levels of the U.S. government, was somehow connected. A man who thought his secrets were safely locked away, even from a dogged federal agent by the name of Pete Elliott. It started with a seemingly ordinary phone call just after 10 in the morning from the Bedford police. At the time, Pete Elliott didn't think it would be a big deal. Typically or weekly, as ATF agents, we deal with firearms and explosives. Bedford police. The Bedford police told Elliott they had just gotten an urgent call from a local business. For veteran detective Tim Alexiak, it was anything but routine. I suppose you get a lot of calls as a local cop and some of them are bigger deals than what it sounds like on the call and some are smaller deals than what it sounds like on the call. That's right. Where did this one fit? This was in the top ten. The police had been alerted by the manager of a self-service storage facility on the edge of town. Someone who had rented one of the units had stopped making payments. After waiting six months, the manager got annoyed, cut the lock off, and opened the door. Then she called police. There was a real sense of urgency, a real sense of urgency. We didn't know exactly what we had until we got there. I was one of the first officers on the scene. Pete Elliott arrived just behind Alexiak. Inside the locker, they found boxes containing an estimated 100 pounds of explosives and blasting caps, and more than a dozen weapons, including an Uzi submachine gun, an unusual shotgun with a double trigger, and a rifle with an odd design on it. They also found a bank deposit envelope and an old trench coat, those items would get a lot of interest later, but it was the dynamite that got everyone's attention that morning. What state were they in? A bad state, deteriorating, leaking, crystallizing. On the boxes, we can tell that they were manufactured in 1976. So we knew we had old dynamite. So essentially what you're telling me is that that storage unit all by itself was a bomb. Absolutely. A bomb whose potential destructive power became apparent immediately. The storage locker was just over the fence from a gas station and right next to an interstate. Across the street was a daycare center. And just down the block was a school. Is it illegal to have explosives in a storage unit? Yes, definitely. And in this case, 20-year old explosives next to a gas station in a daycare center or school, definitely illegal. Ironically, on the boxes of blasting caps was a less than subtle reminder that explosives and children don't mix. Bob Reed was the Bedford police chief in charge of the scene that morning. How many people do you think were threatened on that day? Um, well, you have a student population of about 300 at the elementary school. 
and the daycare, I believe there were 75 to 100 kids there. The interstate highway, which is close, you have thousands a day that go by there. So that particular day, it'd have to be at least 750 people that I were at the possibility of an explosion and, and of a tragedy. Everyone's nerves were on edge. No one who responded to the call had seen anything like it. Tim Alexiak grew even more concerned after he talked to the bomb squad technician on the scene. I've never had that situation before where a bomb tech would actually say, I only want myself and one other bomb person here. I want everybody else out of here. It's never happened before. So we knew it was a very volatile situation at that point. Dynamite gets more unstable over time. ATF experts would later say that the explosives were so volatile, a bug crawling across this dynamite might have been enough to set it all off. They leaked all over and they got nitro The ATF and the local bomb squad knew they had to get rid of the dynamite and fast. The highway was closed. The children evacuated. Then the explosives were removed from their boxes and taken out of town. Bob Reed was there when they were detonated. It was huge. This mushroom cloud had to go... 75, 100 feet in the air, and I mean, it just mushroomed, and the ground shook. You felt this one in your bones. Oh, absolutely. It was the sound of dodging a bullet. Yeah. Bedford, Ohio was out of danger, but somehow its homespun tranquility had attracted someone with 100 pounds of explosives and a small arsenal. Who and what had been hiding out in Bedford? We were totally uh, clueless the first day, literally. Uh, we didn't know what we had to go on. My initial thoughts that day is it had to be somebody back in the early 1980s. More than likely was mob related. It's somebody that is in jail now, going to get out and going to save this stuff for a rainy day. Why else would you keep it around for that many years? The lease records for the locker didn't seem to be of much help. All the names on the lease were fake. At one point, the renter had listed an address, but it was for this convenience store in a nearby suburb. Elliot couldn't find a connection. So he zeroed in on the unusual way the rent had always been paid. Always in cash, never in check, or never leaving a trail behind. So but it, there was an actual person with that money coming to that storage unit. Absolutely. Every month or periodically to make those payments. Right, right. Regular cash payments made in person meant there might be a witness. Elliot discovered that indeed a manager at the storage facility was able to give ATF agents a description of the woman who had come in monthly to pay the rent in cash. Elliot thought he had his first break in the case. The manager said that this female would be in her 50s now, was small, about 5'2", petite, dark complected, dark hair, dark eyes. So we had a sketch, we had a composite of a female that was paying the payments between 1983 and 1989. You looked at the sketch. Right. Did you think that it had any, any value in terms of solving this crime? At the beginning, no. No. It looked like a 35, 40-year-old female. It was a pretty typical composite. About one in a billion. Exactly. So it wasn't surprising that when the ATF released the composite to the local media, no one called saying they recognized her. It looked like this lead was another dead end. But Pete Elliott would not give up. I've always been under the belief, and I learned a long time ago, that everything in life can be traced. And even when you think nobody's looking at you, somebody's watching you. And that you always believe behind clues, no matter what. Always. Always. Being a cop is in Pete Elliott's bones. His great-grandfather was a police chief. His father was a deputy sheriff and later a U.S. Marshal. Even after Pete himself joined the U.S. Marshal Service, he had his sights set on joining the ATF. It was my first choice, you know, and I take pride.